Um, some of the questions that we had this far, the first one is for Rick. Um, you shared a wide range of potential problem areas, and um, in your experience, what are one or the two most common areas that you can attribute to an accident? From example, or from uh, personal experience and, and looking at others, I think fatigue and not monitoring is is the underlying factor to a lot of the accidents because we're not thinking clearly, we're not taking adequate breaks, we're we're in the rush to get everything done and we're not doing it in the right order or or we misplace or misstep. Uh, an example would be as an individual was uh, working late at night and was on the edge of a, of a ditch, was sleeping in the tractor, uh, was woke up by the radio, said, we need you over here. And he wakes up and drives the tractor and drives into a drainage ditch because all of his bearings were back into place yet to realize where he was at. That's an example. Uh, drive lines are also something that happen uh, periodically, they're probably the most devastating when they do happen, so that's what we hear about. Uh, of course, uh, it's always a tragedy when we lose people uh, with the um, uh, going down into the pits or that, you know, with the, what Cheryl has shared. Uh, I was also looking at the questions a little bit, and I seen there was one about using gypsum. And my memory serves me that there were two young boys that were overtaken. Uh, they survived in Wisconsin, but were overtaken by fumes on an outdoor lagoon as well. So, you know, these are things that we need to pay particular attention to when we're out there working. But I would say fatigue is probably the number one that we need to monitor and the rest will go by the wayside. Thanks, Rick. Um, Cheryl, the next question I have is for you. Um, and they were asking, do any of the Wisconsin dairy farmers use gypsum for bedding, and would that have been used for bedding on this farm by chance? Um, the person that's asking here says that they've seen very high hydrogen sulfide in open storages on farms that use um, gypsum. So yeah, let's go back a, a minute, and the gypsum is a good question, and here's why I did not include gypsum at this time in this discussion. The farm um, and the layout of the farm is that this was a dairy steers and a feedlot setting, and Dave Kummel, our structure specialist, having been to the farm, um, we're not aware that gypsum was being used in that setting because it's not our typical dairy farm. Um, we're not familiar, and when, when Pennsylvania started looking at the gypsum bedding situation, we did an inquiry. We weren't seeing the gypsum bedding being used here the, the same way as, you know, towards the, the eastern states we're having. Um, but it, it is on our list of things just to look at. So at the present time, giving the type of animals, the facility designs, we're, we're not putting gypsum, even though it creates that higher sulfur content. We'll look at some of the other factors that could create um, potentially some higher hydrogen sulfur content, um, how, how, sorry, hydrogen sulfide content in this situation. So, and as Rick mentioned, the, the case with the two young individuals, just to be clear, um, that was out in Pennsylvania. Someone else emailed me um, on the side regarding the Maryland case, and I knew there was some, some potential with the gypsum on that one. And I think those of us who work in this area um, will all draw in some other experts as we get working on it. But right now, we're not not holding, not saying no gypsum wasn't a factor, but um, we need to, to gather some more information. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you for the clarification on that, too, Cheryl. I was told that it was Wisconsin, but uh, regardless of where it was, it is something we need to take care of. But thank you for clarifying that. Thanks, Rick. All right, the next question is uh, during came in during Cheryl's presentation. 
but um, anybody can answer this. Is there any place that skin disease incidence or skin disease risk is measured? Um, Mike says, for example, those are all of, are those involved with manure having incidence of cellulitis or other skin, blood, or bone bacterial infections at a higher rate? Um, if they're not at a higher rate, are their infections harder to get rid of after contracting them? Um, are, essentially, are any of these disease aspects of safety tracked? So, not, this is Cheryl. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, one of the hard part is gathering any types of injury and illness, and whether there's um, one of the, the NIOSH centers or another university that is looking at, at that question, I'm not aware of at this time. Um, but we can, I can do some further checking and, and help, get, help get back to that question. All right. Um, Jill asked, what do mon air monitoring equipment meters cost? Do you know, Cheryl? You know, we're, we're going to go back to the, the situation of what are we going to be using that air monitor for? And if I'm going to be entering that confined space, I'm going to be looking for that multiple gas monitor. I'm going to be needing something with a pump. How often am I going to be making that? What other features do I want in a system? So we have a system here um, that has the calibration and the bump, um, have an ammonia sensor in it, and that costs us about $7,500. But you can get to the other side of it is, it, you know, if you're going to be having an employee that's just um, working where you're loading the tankers up, that you could um, have one of the lower cost um, multi-gas monitors. I uh, you know one hauler uses a single gas hydrogen sulfide that, you know, are a few hundred dollars. So you really have to look at, you know, what are you going to be doing? What features do you need in your monitor and, and the use of it? Um, and then work with a good um, safety company or a safety specialist that, that helps you look for the right monitor for your operation or the purpose that you're, you're working with. All right, thank you. Uh, Mike asked, um, who, as a regulator, who's liable for cleanup after a spill or runoff event if people are standing there pointing fingers, trading contract copies? Um, what, who is it, who's actually responsible? In Wisconsin, where he's at, he says that um, the farm operator is ultimately responsible for, for the manure from the very beginning to the very end. So in other places, is that different? Um, well, again, we're talking two different sources of liability. So under regulations, that may be the case. Uh, but if we're talking negligence, that is, there's not a violation of a state statute or regulation. Perhaps it harms somebody's property but doesn't get into a water stream. Then negligence comes down to who actually was responsible. Um, and that, that could be a contractual issue. Uh, but each state is different. That's why it's important to know uh, what regulations uh, you have in your state. And also, it's all, it's, again, it's important to understand that there is statutory or regulatory liability, like you're talking about. There's also negligence um, when it's not a violation of a statute but does cause harm to somebody. So the answer is, like a lot of legal questions, it depends. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Um, Jill asked of you, Rob, of what percentage of agreements on manure application do you think are written versus oral? This written contract to me is relatively new. So, uh, I would say less than half are in writing from my experience. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm out here spreading the word. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. Um, how, then this question can be for anybody, how do you feel about regular safety inspections by a third party um, for, that need to do of manure, op manure operators? So manure operators having a third party come in to do a safety inspection. Is that a, is that a common thing or is that something that should be done? 
I think the value to it is that it gives you a different set of eyes to look at your operation. You know, it's easy to walk by um, some of the, the hazards on a daily basis and not see or not be aware of some of the risks. And so it, it's good to bring in somebody that can help you with that assessment that understands really what are they to be looking for as the hazards. Um, there's a lot of different types of, of safety people out there, not always individuals with experience um, with our agriculture. I think of one of our farms here in Wisconsin that was cleaning out in the digester and they hired a safety consultant and they proceeded to go on to, to share at this program I was at that when they lost their vision, they went and got swimming goggles to give them eye protection. And so, so be sure that you, you get somebody to help you um, assess that facility that, that would understand. And then you also have to, to look at getting your whole written plan for confined, you know, if you have confined spaces and the training. And if you're uh, an applicator coming in and working on a farm, you need to be aware, you know, of who has what responsibilities. You know, the farm has their hazard communication plan. You're coming, you're coming in, are your employees trained? Um, it's a big, broad area that we could be doing this topic um, for a couple of these webinars and still not cover, but, but we'll continue on and feel free to contact myself or one of our other safety specialists in, in the area. All right. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to answer those, put those in the Q&A box and we'll be glad to get those answered. If you have further questions, contact information for Rick and Bob are on the, um, on the flyer and I will get that flyer updated with Cheryl's information as well so you all can contact them directly if you have further questions. Um, at that time, I want to thank you all for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you all next month when we talk about the EPA uh, nutrient rec recycling program. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everybody.